Um, yeah, thanks for this presentation. It was really interesting. I just want to maybe uh, talk about two um, questions and then uh, just raise an issue for everyone. Um, so in the low-income countries, um, at least for Kenya and Ghana, you guys pointed to a low el uh, employment elasticity of growth. And I would argue that you're interpreting that indicator wrong. Um, because what you have is declining labor force participation. Uh, and since most people can't afford to be unemployed except the high end, if labor force participation declines, you have a decline in employment. Why do you have declining labor force participation? Because young people are staying in school longer. And so, um, and that's a good thing. Um, so actually, for Kenya, I am not at all surprised that you have no relationship between informal sector employment and growth. There's no necessity of a relationship. The relationship between informal sector employment is related to the growth of the labor force and the labor force participation rate. Uh, so I would suggest you think about reinterpreting that um, statistic. I, I, I personally actually don't like it. I, I prefer the statistic that William cited, which is the poverty elasticity um, to growth. Then on the demographic dividend, I think um, I'm wondering if people are being optimistic. Um, you know, the, the size of the dividend depends on the rate of change. Uh, I could explain that intuitively, but um, Lee and Mason have uh, done the math for it, so you can um, check it there. Um, and the rate of change is very slow. Uh, deaths are going um, down, thank God, but fertility is going down very slowly. And so the likelihood of a dividend uh, of any size is quite low. And it's true that it's important to have, you know, education policies, et cetera, but there's another policy that's needed before that. Um, in order to actually get the dividend in the first place. And finally, I think I want to pick up where Lemma left off. I had written down on my notes savings. It would be really great to discuss um, the savings rate in Africa um, and the role of private and public savings in domestic private and public f savings and financing growth, why the savings rate is low. Lemma, I was a little intrigued by your idea that financial sector reform could raise it. Um, but, um, you know, you can uh, talk about that in the comments, but I just think um, a little discussion about the savings rate might have been helpful. And it's your turn, Mr. Central Bank. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I want to pick up on an issue raised by Lemma <coughs> on uh, the development of state uh, promoting inclusive, uh, inclusive growth. And I just want to uh, get from the presenters uh, the lessons from these lions on constructing a developmental state, given what Ernest pointed out yesterday, that uh, the objectives of these politicians seem to be focused more at getting re-elected, as opposed to longer-term objectives that are required for a developmental state. Uh, thank you for these <coughs> quite interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Knut Tonstad. I come from Norad, Norway. Um, uh, it would have been nice also to include uh, Ethiopia, which is a country with very strong uh, family planning policies and an extremely high uh, savings rate. It's approximately 35% uh, of disposable income divided by GDP. So it's twice as high uh, as the average in, in, in Africa. And in, in Ethiopia also there is only government banking as was in et, uh, both Korea and Taiwan province during the whole 60s and 70s. So, so actually the period of extremely strong growth in many of these uh, East uh, Asian countries was a period of go pure government banking and no private banks at all. Uh, <coughs> so uh, I think one experience from Africa is that the, the liberalization of the banking sector has uh, contributed to uh, lower savings probably, uh, more, uh, more credit going to households than before, 
and also very high margins in the banking sector. Bank, the banking sector is the most profitable sector in Africa, uh, apart from resources. I think that the, the rate of return, for instance, in Kenya just a couple of years ago on, on, on shares was 27%. So, so it's a problem that uh, industry is competing with uh, uh, governments, with uh, the consumers, and with the banks themselves for, for credit. Uh, so you have extremely uh, expensive finance for uh, domestic uh, industries. That is one of the reasons why you don't have more uh, industrial development in, in Africa, and why, uh, and why they had it uh, in, in Asia, I think. It would be, in my view, uh, uh, the, the liberalization of uh, credit uh, happened too early in Africa. At, uh, in 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 Asia, they uh, they waited in Korea and, and Taiwan until the until the 80s and the 90s. So it has come to a bit too early in Africa. I, I would like to hear some comments on that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Donald Mar from Repoa, Tanzania. Uh, I have one question to uh, William. Uh, when I followed your presentation, uh, unless I'm mistaken, in one slide you showed quite a drastic decline in the growth rate of the finance sector between 2015 to 2017. I would like to know what drived that decline and what effect that might have on the real sector of the economy. Uh, thank you. These were very insightful uh, presentations. Rolf van der Hoeven of the Institute of Social Studies. And I think one of the points you made, how important the labor market is. Now, what struck me in the presentations of all the studies is that you look mainly at the formal labor market and very little at the informal labor market, sometimes mentioned in between. But if you see the numbers, it's 75% of the people are engaged or work, how do you, in, 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 in the informal sector. Um, so, in that respect, I have one question and uh, one suggestion. Uh, the question is, uh, the informal sector, there was a research project, partly in wider ISS, Michael Grimm was involved, where actually if you decompose the informal sector, it's not a uniform sector at all. There are, uh, according to that research project, that was mainly done in West Africa, French-speaking West Africa, there are gazelles in the informal sector, about 20% of the uh, activities in the formal sector are growing. Then you have a middle class of about 10, 20 percent of the informal sector, with a bit of support. It can also growing, and you have both in those countries then 40 to 50 percent of the informal sector, for which the informal sector is actually no employment. It's just to save life, to 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 stay on living. And so my question is, can we change the research that we focus much more on the potential of the upper part of the formal sector in a uh, number of uh, activities uh, but for that we need numbers so we need uh, to, uh, to do research on that so it's question have you in your um, uh, work have you been able to dig out already some of those aspects of a dynamic part of the informal sector and a non-dynamic part of the formal sector and secondly how would you go about it uh, for the next phase uh, of your uh, research thank you very much so I think we can take two more. There was Nigel and then in front here. Thanks. Uh, and I think it's been, this has raised many, many uh, issues, but just a few sort of slightly scattered comments. I think uh, the first would have been useful, unless I missed it in the beginning, to have uh, a bit more of a description on, on who the lions were and the, maybe a bit more around this research. That seemed to be, uh, we got sort of pockets of it. You've got to buy the book for that. <laughs> I'm a civil servant, I can't afford it. <laughs> Just a comment also on the dem demographic dividend. Why do we call it a dividend? Is that something I know it's sort of uh, been coming on, shouldn't we, as in Sam's presentation around the challenges with Mozambique, shouldn't we start dropping the term dividend and calling it uh, a burden or challenge or something along those lines. So maybe not the most politically correct uh, comment, but uh, do we still need to keep calling it the demographic dividend? Uh, then just a question for Carmen. I mean, you uh, you mentioned uh, transport and communications being, it's, it's grown particularly rapidly, but as per Stiglitz's comment, is it really a sector that is driving the economy? 
transport and communications. Those are dependent on other sectors. So uh, I, I don't see how it's a driver of, uh, as a sector. It's very much dependent on the growth in other sectors. Um, and then just a comment on the disaggregation of the public sector and the, or, or the, uh, the role of the unions in the public sector. I think unlike firms where you've got unionized and non-unionized firms, in the public sector there's uh, public sector bargaining and in a way the unions are there to deal with sort of micro issues from a, at, a, at, a, at a level. So I'm not sure that your, your statistics uh, can, is it really the case that there's a distinction between those that are, that are part of union, that are unionized or not? So I'm not convinced about that. And then uh, finally, just a comment. Uh, well, I think there could be a lot more work around this term, the development, uh, developmental state. It's not just about an approach, but it's around uh, how one builds uh, and commits to, uh, perhaps from a political, from a leadership perspective, how one really builds capacity in the state. So it's not just about an approach or a policy uh, choice. It's really around building capacity, and I think this is where Africa is uh, generally uh, has a very, very long way to go in terms of building up the, the capabilities to, to intervene as a comment. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, and uh, thanks all presenters for the good presentations. I'm called Susan Kavma from Makaya University in Uganda. Uh, uh, my comment is on structural transformation, and um, I'm I want, I'm reconciling the talk we've had from Stiglitz with what we've just had. Uh, there is an issue of comparative advantage. Should Africans completely drop that idea of comparative advantage? Uh, or we should think about it and look at sectors that have, give us comparative advantage. When uh, Ndugu, uh, uh, Professor Njuguna was presenting, I was surprised he didn't talk much about tourism in Kenya. So I think Africa, we need to identify our comparative advantage, Take, taking us back to the role of agriculture. Uh, Professor Stiglitz told us that agriculture shouldn't be seen just as an end, but a means to enable us to achieve so much. We know that uh, productivity is driven by capital. It's argumented by capital. Perhaps that is the line we need to take that we should also increase the productivity in agriculture or tourism, whatever our comparative advantage is, so as uh, uh, to provide lessons and also achieve many other objectives that we can achieve. The second one is this on skills mismatch. Boteng uh, presented this, that there's a skills mismatch in Ghana. I think I'd, I would like to defer. When you look at your presentation, uh, when you're looking at uh, the sectors that have a high demand for labor, it was social services, business, and the like. And then even in uh, the supply side, it is still that, you know, individuals are rational. They'll demand courses that give them, that have higher employment opportunities. So I think we need to rethink the issue of skills mismatch. In my view, it's mainly a problem of low demand, low jobs created, that is why we have unemployment. Okay. Um, should we go in reverse order? Let's start with Carmen. If we, and um, Lemma, do you want? Well, let's just start with Carmen. We'll end with Lemma. How about that? Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll address some of the questions more related to my presentation. Uh, I guess from Nigel, we had some comments about transport and communications. I suppose in the sense that we use the word driver, it's that it's a source of more rapid employment growth relative to other sectors. I think part of this sector has kind of direct demand, like this kind of um, consumer demand, but part of it is also due to linkages to other sectors. So I think we have to then figure out how much of this is kind of like direct demand versus linkages, uh, which I don't really have the answer now. But I mean, I guess we were not kind of trying to uh, encourage the idea that this is all we can rely on. I think that a proper industrial uh, 
policy and industrialization strategy is still required. And services sectors that have some export components might be useful to focus on. Um, so yeah, I think you have to have a more diverse approach to that. On the public sector union uh, question, I mean, I suppose we are using the standard labor force surveys and now we would probably have to look into that more in detail as you uh, have discussed about how bargaining takes place. Um, it's not really something I can answer right now, but it's something we should, is probably important and we should look into, I think. Uh, on the demographic dividend, it's interesting you asked the question, but essentially it should be a dividend if the ratio of effective workers to effective consumers rises, so that average income per capita rises. The problem comes is that if there's not sufficient employment, then you're not getting the rise in that ratio that gives you the growth boost. So for South Africa, there was somewhat of a demographic dividend, but it seems to have all dissipated by now. So I'm not sure how that's been estimated for other uh, countries. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you for some uh, very interesting comments. Um, yeah, just I guess some scattered responses. Um, in respect to the question about uh, the demographic dividend, yeah, I mean, I would certainly reinforce exactly what uh, Carmen mentioned and reinforce as well that uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, in my reading of the Mozambican policy environment, you know, firm, uh, robust policies towards towards fertility or birth control uh, have been lacking. So that has been a real element that's missing in the in in the broader discussion. Uh, and of course, that is creating these challenges because if these new workers aren't workers, they remain dependents, and so you don't get the demographic dividend that that could emerge. Um, on uh, the role of the banking sector and financial sector, I think this is. Uh, yeah, a very interesting area that um, admittedly, I think, needs a bit more research. From what I know about the Mozambican uh, banking sector experience, I think there's two things that are worth pointing out. One, there has been a you know, substantial increase in the banking sector or substantial growth in the banking sector over time. Um, nonetheless, this has two components. One, it has been associated with extremely high profit margins largely due to the relationship it has with uh, the public sector. So, you know, the public sector is just, you know, re-channeling funds through on a very short-term basis. So uh, the, the banks don't need to go anywhere to, to earn money. Uh, they can just basically finance the public sector on short-term debt. Um, and secondly, um, while there has been some increase in credit to the private sector, this is very short-term credit, often around consumer goods. Uh, so you don't get the what you might call productive credit with a long-term uh, focus. Um, why that's the case? I mean, that's that's of course a much broader discussion. Um, so I think that is an interesting area where policy perhaps could be uh, could be much more effective. Um, two briefly, two brief comments on the developmental state, and I think this you know discussion about the developmental state is extremely interesting. Um, but I do have two concerns. I think. Uh, Relating back to one of the comments, implementation capacity, you know, to, to implement developmental state-like policies it seems to be highly problematic. And my, uh, my experience has been that there's no shortage of policies. The problem is the implementation. Uh, and I think many of us who've worked in uh, developing countries would probably uh, nod about that. So, you know, we can have great policies with great objectives and, you know, uh, and uh, that look good on paper, but the problem is they just stay on paper. So how do we get to the implementation stage and effective implementation? Uh, the, the other point about the developmental state, at least the lessons from the Mozambican experience, is that I think before we even think about getting the policies right, let's just not get them wrong. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that seems a bit flippant, <laughs> but actually, I mean, I think it's, it's easier to identify the wrong policies, the genuinely damaging policies, than identifying, well, this is the right or optimal set of policies. So I think, and I think there, if we shift the focus to creating institutional environments which avoid the wrong policies, then that might be a productive first step towards a longer term goal of developing, uh, of, towards a developmental state. And I would probably say, at least in my experience, that that, that first step is necessary, at least in some countries, and I can't speak for all of them. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me um, start with the questions from a reverse order. Start with um, your point about um, uh, can we use the relative comparative advantage that we have, even the sectors, and, and, and you even pointed that I didn't talk about Kenya's tourism. But I think the point I was making is that we saw, we, if we resolve the binding constraints that are a, a plague in some of the sectors, then those sectors will take their, 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 their advantage in terms of the, the, the resolution of the constraints. And let me give you an example. Tourism is one of them. But you can see how Kenyan tourism suffers just because of perhaps even terrorist attack or even transport uh, to uh, some areas. Look at the cut flower industry. Kenya was leading in cut flower. It's still leading in the cut flower industry. But if you look at, if you, were, if you got the heartland of the farms in the cut flower that have produced cut flowers for the last perhaps 20 or so years, then you find that they are empty. They are migrating to Ethiopia. That's why Ethiopia is becoming the second in terms of cut flower industry. The question then you ask, what is the problem? And you can come and find that there are some very, they can be resolved. One of them is uh, labor conflicts. The other one is up definition of, appropriate definition of property rights. The third they have been working on is being encroached. And the third one is purely the, the power, that is power services, that, that is electricity in terms of control of price and even outages. So you find that these are problems that can be solved. So we go back to binding constraints. That's why my argument was that Kenya is, has a location advantage. You can actually bring in, bring in some infrastructure uh, or physical infrastructure as well as uh, any other form of infrastructure and even the legal frame, strengthen the institutional and legal frameworks and then you'll find that some of the sectors will take uh, advantage of that. And that is where the problem is coming in. Um, uh, I think Nigel and uh, Ruiz about the developmental state. I, 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 I think it's an interesting concept, but uh, we go back to uh, yesterday. Is it yesterday? We're talking about, you know, um, I think, um, the, um, the lecture by Ernest yesterday. And for example, I've been looking at Kenya itself, and one of the what intrigues me is actually to see what happens with political cycles after every election and all that. We came from a very difficult past in 2003, and look at it. President Kibaki said that what we really need is policies to restart and sustain growth. And all of a sudden, from 2003 to 2007, everything worked so well. And everybody was very, very optimistic to the point where they came up with a vision 2030. But just, just look at what happens in 2007, 2008, and since then we have been grappling with that. Look at the new government. What is the problem? The problem is that every time we have a political uh, election cycle, new governments come in, they lose focus, and they have massive coordination failures. And that is where it checks the development so far. That is why everybody thinks we are going to have a developmental state, but in the end, you look at where, where are we? Right, right now, right now, although I wouldn't want to criticize uh, the things in Kenya right now, but you can see the new president, the president now is focusing on his second term, is focusing on the big four. But then we had vision 2030. Where did it go? We are not yet. 2030 yet. So you can see lack of focus and then massive coordination problems comes in. So um, I think uh, <laughs> I, I, I like the, 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 the point about uh, financial sector, uh, uh, financial sector uh, uh, development and even liberalization. It, and, and obviously the competition of resources in terms of the industry is competing for resources and because the, 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 the credit becomes very, very expensive. But of course, in, uh, at the very end, we have come up with this debate. Again, financial repression is not going to work. Liberalize, and then when you liberalize, then the market structure is also very problematic. So we have to go back and fix the market structure. Right now, because I, I think there's a point that was raised by Ruiz uh, 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 about savings. One of them is, uh, if you look at uh, the Kenyan case in terms of virtual savings, it's actually it's massive savings, and I've been looking at the characteristics of those who are saving. But essentially, they are saving for short-term, very, 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 very small investments because they are also constrained by their levels of income. But most of them are actually saving to solve some cash constraint because it's, 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 they are cash, cash constrained. But if we want to roll out these mega uh, projects in terms of solving the problem of savings uh, investment cycles, it can be done.
But we have to go back again and say, how do we fix? Because the, the problem is not lack of, uh, uh, it, the problem is sometimes lack of uh, bankable projects that you can roll out. And that is where, again, Biden, we come back to Biden constraints. I'll look into, I think, Van Hooven and uh, Luis again, the informal sector. I, I think we need to break it down. And that's the point. We were trying to see. Everybody, every write-up in Kenya is that the informal sector is going to be the, 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 the one to absorb employment. The informal sector is expanding. The, but when you look at its characteristics, it doesn't look like it's correlated with everything. So it's like, it's an escape route. It's an escape route. It is maybe a discriminatory queuing process of people waiting to be employed in informal sector jobs, but they are not forthcoming. So then you find that the units themselves don't expand. It is the, 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 the number of units that increase and something that we can uh, look at. I think, uh, I think, uh, I'll start. So just a quick one. Uh, I'll start with, uh, <laughs> I'll start with Louise, uh, uh comment on the interpretation of the employment elasticity and uh, I think if you just look at the participation rate uh, to interpret it you may also have a challenge because in developing countries you need to put the inactivities uh, into perspective those in school and those who are not in school and if you look at the data that Ghana has of course we are having people staying in in school for a long time but we also have inactivity outside the school system also going up so if you look at the need not in employment education and training over, over a period, you see that it's also going up. So if you absorb unemployment into need, then you see that, yes, the employment, the employment elasticity issue is well interpreted, especially if you break the inactivities into that. So before <coughs> interpreting, you need to look at participation, all right, but you need to also look at the breakdown as sufficient condition to be able to interpret the, the, the elasticity well. So that is the reaction to that. And the question about uh, the financial and I asked myself, that was the update from Tanzania. Uh, over the last three years, 2015, 16, 17, I saw the financial intimidation, the growth going down, and I asked myself what uh, is happening. The first thing that came into mind was, well, perhaps the regulators, the regulator is trying to crack the whip, trying to sanitize the situation, but that only started last year. So what happened 15, 16, and 17? So uh, I don't have an answer to it. Perhaps I need to dig deeper to find out why uh, the growth in the financial sector over the last three years has been going down. And the scale mismatch, I don't know whether in the slide I put a question mark, and that's why when you were asking the question, I was nodding. I, there's a study that, I, that, that I'm doing to look at the scale mismatch deeper. And a PhD student I'm supervising is looking at that. And what comes up that if you look at advertised job vacancies in Ghana uh, over from 1984 up to current. And of course, it is corroborated by what the central bank also uh, does in terms of advertised jobs. Because you said that most of the jobs that are advertised are, are not the science-based, mostly looking for people in the social science and so on. So it also brought a question. So why the scale uh, mismatch? And I conducted interview uh, with employers. And the employers made it clear that you look at it and uh, if manufacturing is going down, those sectors that require engineers are not growing. So you expect that people who even come out uh, with engineering degree try to shift to the humanity because they think that that is where the jobs are. So then it also brought some kind of thinking. So is it the STEM or is it the fact that the jobs are not there for the STEM? And if you have high informality, uh, then it means that we need to look at the STEM question very well. So we'll be able to have the STEM to be very useful if the Ghanaian economy is able to grow, be able to get those sectors that absorb people with the STEM. But and that is some of the things that came up uh, in terms of interaction. So normally when I talk about the STEM mismatch, I put a question mark. Because from the demand side, it looks like the jobs, the, the, the labor demand is coming from for those who uh, in the humanities, but then it's not coming for, for the STEM. But then we, we continue to have that. So we need, it needs to be interrogated quite uh, critically. I think uh, I'll end here. Lemon, do you want uh, just a minute or two? The chair has told me that I only have one minute. So uh, I just want to weigh in on finance. Uh, I know that we blame financial liberalization, high interest margins, 
One thing that we need to be aware of is because we have dysfunctional banking systems. We have, not, we have not gotten the design features of finance in Africa. And one of the low-hanging fruits is integration of finance across countries. And this hard, these ingredients are out there. The issue is the political economy on, uh, on the developmental state, right? Um, to me, uh, if you have a benevolent social planner, you actually get social optimality. But that's not very likely to happen, right? So these things are very specific, and I know that uh, things have actually happened in that context uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and it's worked, you know, in the short span, but there, there has also been overshooting, you know, you know because of, remember what happened when uh, they started expanding beyond Addis? There was a, a massive movement, and we have you know, the rise of Abi Ahmed, and now he's talking about privatization, liberalization, right? Um, so I think you're right. It's, it's a cycle. It's a political cycle. And so I, 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 it, when, it, when it comes to government, the issue is not that government should not play a role. Yeah, you need a well-functioning governance for well-functioning markets. The issue is whether or not the government is in its comparative advantage uh, or operating in areas of comparative advantage. And typically what happens is that it ends up operating both areas of comparative disadvantage and advantage and then creates what is not the mixed economy and then makes, becomes mixed up economy. That's the issue. So, <laughs> so that, okay, thank you. Great. I thought uh, we would actually have time for a second round. That's not going to happen. Uh, enjoy your lunch, but please join me in thanking the uh, authors. <laughs>